Occultism as a kind of local religion and how it can reveal regional South Asian practices as well. And to do this, we'll be focusing on a specific case study. There are many case studies that we could have chosen uh, for today, but this is going to be the focus uh, today. And I have a hypothesis here that we can better understand historical practices of yoga by examining the many threads that make up modern yoga's integration into occult literature and practice, especially in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This especially reveals more data on how regional yogas intersected with Sanskrit traditions and esotericism in colonial modernity. So you can tell me if the hypothesis is satisfactory or not by the end of the, the talk. So for the part one, I'll talk about kind of forms of global modern yoga. So for the non-specialist, this is a very abbreviated uh, chart of centuries and centuries of uh, study. But basically, um, around the sixth century of the Common Era, you had Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which some of you might have heard of, um, which kind of marks classical yoga. And there's some intersection with Buddhism as well during that time. Around the 12th century, we had the development of medieval Hatha Yoga. Um, so it's not Hatha, it's Hatha. So the, the Bindu there makes it hard, Hatha. Hatha Yoga, which is kind of uh, physical practices, notions of kind of preserving the bindu or seed, generative fluid, and all sorts of other mudras or locks and seals. And then around the 17th century, you started to have Sufi engagement with yoga become pretty well established. And then by the 19th century, you had the development of modern yoga. And some questions here uh, that sort of form, you know, some food for thought, if you will, is modern yoga a historical transformation of Hinduism or Buddhism, especially of its religious practices? Is it the globalization of an authentic cultural tradition, the original substance of which has been distorted in the process, or was it always changing to begin with? These are questions that maybe you all can think about and, and answer as we go along. So, Modern yoga as it's framed today are, um, is normally in terms of five key types. And in this, I'm following Elizabeth de Michelis uh, in her chapter, Modern Yoga History and Forms. And she outlines uh, five main types, psychosomatic yoga, neo-Hindu yoga, postural yoga, meditational yoga, and denominational forms of yoga. And modern psychosomatic yoga or MPSY um, is usually associated with Swami Vivekananda and Raja Yoga. He gave these lectures to the World Parliament of Religions in 1893, I believe, in Chicago. And uh, these lectures were published as Raja Yoga, but he was really pulling off of Patanjali and the Yoga Sutras, so kind of hearkening back to classical yoga, but also incorporating a whole bunch of new thought ideas and other things of that nature. Modern Neo-Hindu yoga is um, something that's been developing in India and South Asia more broadly. So you have Bharatiya Yoga, uh, Sanstan, and Baba Ramdev, and there's a whole kind of uh, uh, notion of kind of being physical, um, activity, kind of a, a, a national aspect to yoga. And um, by far the most popular is modern postural yoga, or MPY as emerging of Swedish gymnastics, breath cultivation, fitness training, asanas, postures or poses, physical techniques of Hatha yoga, kind of taking some from the medieval corpus, but modifying them in kind of an exorcist, uh, exercise and, and fitness scheme. And again, we have this word Hatha come up in this uh, postural yoga context as force in Sanskrit. Normally, at least in the medieval context, it was the force. <laughs> Okay, the force of kundalini kind of being activated. Um, so if that was your kundalini experience for tonight, I suppose, with the, the hatha force happening here. But for those of you who want to learn more, definitely read the Singleton uh, book for postural yoga. And from postural yoga, uh, intersecting with the um, kind of the neo-Hindu yoga, we have an international day of yoga that's um, been observed uh, for the past 10 years or so. And it's all around the world, including in China. So as this uh, picture makes clear. Then you have modern meditational yoga. And uh, this is uh, reformers and yogis and swamis like Paramahansa Yogananda, who came to the United States, Boston and California, 
and kind of started this uh, self-realization fellowship, also incorporated some devotional elements into it and, and new thought as well. But the focus was mostly on meditation and it was kind of specific to um, a specific group. Um, in his case, this self-realization fellowship. And then we have modern denominational yoga. So this would be um, Osho, uh, as an example, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. You might have seen the, the documentary Wild, Wild Country on Netflix that kind of talks about this movement uh, translocating from, uh, I think it's Mumbai to, to Oregon, this form. And you have people practicing uh, within this sort of uh, set denomination, right? So there's certain yogas that are practice within um, this particular movement, and that would be denominational yoga. But these are all developing from the 1920s and 1930s onwards, so we're not really dealing with things that are happening earlier. And as you can see, this is not just my own idea of this typology, but it started to kind of gain currency, especially among yoga uh, practitioners. And so um, a friend and colleague, Jackie uh, Hargreaves, has published this on the Luminescent blog, which is very popular um, among yoga practitioners. And you see these same typologies, the NHY, MPSY, MDY, and kind of attempts to sort of um, delineate and distinguish between different threads of modern yoga. Now, Sensing a problem, right? Okay, maybe we could all go home and say, oh, you know everything about modern yoga, right? We can all go home now and finish the lecture, right? No? We're not going anywhere. No, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> oh man, I thought, I thought we were all done. Okay, so sensing a problem, what could be missing, right? What could be missing from this formula? Don't we know everything about modern yoga now? And so here's where I will incorporate some sensuous description, thanks to uh, Paul Stoller's workshop, those of you who have been joining. So I remember the first time walking up to Sri Sabapati Lingeshwara Koil, the temple of Sabapati as Lord of the Lingam, a phallic stone that many Hindus worship as the cosmic form of Shiva. Anyone who spends time in South India will soon encounter the postcard perfect Tamil temples on the pilgrimage or tour circuits, such as the towering medieval stone Gopuram gates of Madurai or Tanjavur. The tiny Sabapati coil, however, was tucked away down a lane unfrequented by the motor sounds of auto rickshaws and ambient foot traffic, opposite to a large towering concrete apartment building that echoes Soviet era efficiency. No tourists come here. A dirt road leads off the pavement, adjacent to a much bigger goddess temple filled with large bunyan trees. A hand-painted street sign at the mouth of the dirt road reads, Samyar Tottam, the Garden of the Swamis. I skeptically walk up with two of my three Tamil student friends who generously gave their time to come with me. One is a Christian coming only as far as the gate for religious reasons. Could this small shrine be the place? I am greeted at a wrought iron gate by an elderly man named Hari Haran, wearing a cream dhoti or wrap with a colorful trim, his white chest hair prominently protruding from his shimmering brown skin. He opens the gate, which makes a loud clang like a train as it opens on its track to the side. The temple coming into view, I feel an inexplicable rhythm or pulse in my head and chest, buzzing like a bee. Bzzz, the hum striking me as an energetic field created by decades of intense and fervent ritual and meditation. In front of me, I see an entry chamber, the floor of which is concrete adorned with white tiles and the walls designating shrines to various gods and goddesses. To the right in the main room is a large romanticized portrait of an ascetic, the patron of alchemists and the Tamil language, the Rishi Agastya with his long black hair in a top knot, and further right, a wall consisting of a glass case full of relatively disorganized books. Yet in the center, past the entry chamber, is the main focal point of the shrine, a phallic stone upon which is decorated two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. In front of the stone are yellow marigold flowers, small tools for worshiping with water, and oil lamps hanging from the ceiling. The fragrance of incense, musky and reminiscent of sandalwood, wafts through the air. The eyes of the stone glimmer with a vibrancy and life that would have alarmed even the most hard-hearted skeptic. I knew I had found the place. I speak what Tamil I know, and my friends help translate when my own words fail. My friend Sivashakti speaks, the letter R's of her voice rolling out of her mouth like a river. She warmly introduces my reason for coming, making the elderly Hariharan smile. I show Hariharan a picture of a yogi, this one. 
who had established a meditation hall on this, on this site over a hundred years back, a picture of a Swami named Sabapati that had long since been lost in the temple. This woodblock print appears like a magical key and Hariharan leads me down a very narrow hallway to a back room hidden from view. In this inner esoteric chamber, paintings of Shiva and Parvati, the goddess, are painted on the walls, colored with bold red and blue strokes, in a local vernacular tantric temple style that seems far removed from popular mainstream romanticizations and so-called calendar art. An interview begins, and while listening, I imagine Sabapati here at the temple. Based on his biographical accounts and woodblock portraits, intended to receive devotion from students and reflect Sabapati's own reflection of Mahadeva, the great God, I imagine him as a slim but well-built figure, dark-skinned with deep penetrating eyes. Three horizontal gray marks of ash adorn his forehead, the sign of a devotee of Shiva, another of Mahadeva's names. When he talks, he is full of metaphor, full of aphorisms, full of another world, like seeing the nature of the infinite spirit clearly through a clear crystal instead of a dusty mirror. He is from the Tamil speaking country, but far from provincial, having parents from the rocky Deccan plateau and having traveled far and wide across the lands of India and Nepal by steam train, cart and walking. While he had a great job, he was disenchanted and searching for an unmediated experience of religion and finds a guru in his hometown of Bellicheri and further south in the mountain of Augustia, full of cascading waterfalls, shimmering lakes and lush green jungle and far from the urban colonial life of Madras. <clears throat> he knows six languages, including English and Hindustani, and is well-versed in the norms of subaltern colonial behavior while being able to challenge them when it suits him. He is sad when he sees his fellow Indians from the cities leaving their spiritual pursuits behind and only striving after materialistic goals. Though he wishes they did more practices and were less theoretical, he was happy to meet foreigners like Helena Blavatsky, born in what is today Ukraine, and Henry Olcott, the eccentric American, during his trip from Madras to Lahore. Though he does not wish to join their society, he appreciates their push to revive the local spiritual currents in his country, especially since it's what other foreigners in the British Raj have tried to dismiss as idolatry or channel into missionary movements. Though not a scholar, he is well-read and has published books on yoga in English, Tamil, Sanskrit, Bengali, Telugu, and Hindustani. He's attracted a following, including a Bengali author named Srish Chandra Boshu, who joined the Theosophical Society, and the British call him a local celebrity. He is also very artistic and a gifted poet and works closely with illustrators to map out the contours of the yogic body, which both foreign and Indian theosophists saw as the astral body or astral double. His main impulse is to either be united with or dissolved into his beloved, the Supreme Shiva as the Lord of all, beyond all gender and conceptuality. For this, he developed an entire system of Shiva Raja Yoga or Royal Yoga for Shiva, based on a combination of medieval and modern sources. A few years later, I visit the same shrine and find a younger middle-aged man who greets me with a warm smile, the edges of his mouth bending the contours of his trimmed mustache. He invites me to sit down at a desk next to the books and the glass case. Our conversation goes something like this. Vanakam, I say, which is the Tamil non-religious equivalent of namaste or salam. Vanakam, he says, and then switches to English, unlike Hariharan, who only spoke Tamil. What are you looking for? I'm searching for more information about Sabapati Swami. This must have been his meditation hall. I gesture around the room. Yes, my father told me about you. I'm Vinayakam. Look, he hung up a picture of you talking with him. He points to the wall, where sure enough, I see a printed picture of Hariharan with a description of our meeting a few years before. My father is sick, he says, otherwise he would be happy to see you. Our conversation continues and time meanders on. I visit occasionally to interview and visit the shrine, blending these sensuous experiences of place with consulting dusty tomes and laminated copies of Sabapathi's books found at the Adyar Library and Research Center and other library archives. Now, when I continued to keep in touch with Vinayagam later, um, I asked him about, you know, what is the significance of the lingam at the shrine? And he said that Mahans, like Sabapati, would, quote, bring themselves to the earth and perform miracles and disappear into the lingam. 
That rung a bell because I was able to connect it to some of the texts that I've studied that kind of um, that survive uh, as part, a part of Sabapati's writings. One such book mentions that the rishis and yogis, after remaining as many hundred years, change their body and bless it to become, quote, the self-divine, spiritual, universal, fully pervaded circle of stone. Thus, many of the phallic stones are nothing more than the metamorphosed bodies of the holy rishis. So there's kind of an ethnographic and a textual link happening between Sabapati and uh, the current managers and caretakers of this sh shrine. And when you start to compare, you can really see that the entire lingam or phallic stone is mapped in some ways onto the face as well as the human body. And so that got me thinking as well as to where it came from. Is it Sapapati's invention? Turns out it is not. It's actually a medieval idea uh, from at least the 12th century of the common era, the Tiro Mandiram, where we have Manudar Akkai Variva Sivalingam. So the human body is the shape of Shiva's phallus. And this was a belief also in um, another sect of Virashaiva sects as well uh, throughout South India. So the more I started to look at Sabapati's works, I started to see that really um, this idea is absolutely everywhere you look. This whole kind of oval is in fact a Shiva Lingam. This is a Shiva Lingam. This is a Shiva Lingam. Mm -hmm. This is a Shiva Lingam. And really in almost every diagram, you'll find some sort of shape that resembles a Shiva Lingam. But what is the significance of this? And in his other works, we have this notion, then you become the infinite spiritual universal circle, talking about this experience of um, the composure or samadhi of Raja Yogam, containing the infinite spirit in solid linga swarupam, embracing the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and all their creations within the universal circle of your linga swarupa. The maya body then becomes as the stage or platform of delusion, goripidam or avadayar to your linga swarupam. And we'll get more into kind of the significance of the pedestal, but there's something definitely gendered going on. And I don't have uh, time to get into the full dimensions of this, but in other of uh, Sabapati Swami's writings, the feminine principle is also located at the top of the head in the form of these three goddesses. But in terms of this pedestal, we have this um, very tantric idea of the lingam and the yoni being attached, and that's making up the, uh, the uh, Shiva lingam. So there are notions of uh, the body in Sanskrit and Tamil, uh, from which uh, Sabapati is pulling from. One of them is Sharira, this notion of a linga Sharira or marked body that transmigrates after death, according to some schools of Hindu philosophy. And then we have this notion of Sukshma Sharira, subtle body, Stula Sharira, physical body or gross body. But the way that Sabapati is using this notion of the linga is as a svarupa, this inherent form, this essential nature. And so we have this notion of a linga svarupa that one can meditate on and embody in um, kind of an alternative sort of way. So it intersects with this notion of body as sharira, but it's also something that's very meditative and very um, kind of uh, along the path of one's own discovery or practice in yoga. So part three, taking it in a little different direction, how was Sabapati and um, you know, these ideas, uh, how were they received in what is kind of called modern occultism today? So we have Henry Olcott, uh, one of the founders of the Theosophical Society, becoming very taken with this diagram of Sabapati Swami, uh, which as you can see is a Shiva Lingam. There's a pedestal here and his head is actually the top of the Shiva Lingam. And so Henry Olcott is saying, the circles are the chakras or centers of forces. And when he has traversed the entire circuit of his corporeal kingdom, he will have perfectly evolved his inner self, disengaged it from his natural state of commixture with the outer shell or physical self. His next step is to project this double outside the body, transferring to it his complete consciousness. And then having passed the threshold of his carnal prison house into the world of psychic freedom. So here we have one of the first examples, if not the first, of um, a theosophy seeing 
a diagram on yoga and linking it to this notion of astral travel, astral projection, um, sort of inner journeys, if you will. And this idea started to take off and it spread to Europe and the United States as well, where um, uh, it entered the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, which had already been inspired by the teachings of the black spiritualist, uh, Pascal Beverly Randolph. So that's kind of another way that some of Sabapati's teachings uh, were integrated into uh, translocal milieus. We also had um, the author John Campbell Oman be extremely interested in uh, Sabapati's teachings. He met with Sabapati and talked to him about his Raja Yoga and compared this notion of the chakras with um, a 19th century novel by Bulwer Lytton called A Strange Story, where he uh, noted the kind of colored lights in the body uh, being similar to Sabapati's uh, chakras or colors in the yogic body. We also had Sabapati start to um, attract an interest by Dr. Franz Hartmann, uh, which is appropriate since we're kind of off Hartmannstrasse, right, here at the center. <laughs> and uh, he was really impressed with Sabapati's yogic diagram, calling it, so physiology is astral corpus, so the physiology of the astral body. And notice, though, what's interesting here is that the pedestal from the earlier diagram is removed. So we only have kind of the body and not the pedestal. But he completed a full, um, well, mostly full translation of Sabapati's 19th century lectures. And you can kind of see how he was pulling from this 1880 color diagram that Henry Olcott was interested in. He had translated this into German, calling it the physiology of the astral body. And then this is a, a modern, um, repainting that I had commissioned in Chennai. And interesting here, notice there's a footnote in some of Franz Hartmann's later editions that shows that this was kind of an active discourse engaged in theosophy. And the footnote reads that Franz Hartmann had in some places intentionally confused the terms etheric and astral body, since he had qualms about publishing the mystery of the etheric body too early. And so differences between etheric and astral bodies would continue to be formulated in theosophical discourses on the subtle body. And so this is part of the beginning of this whole discourse on what does it mean to have an astral body, to astral project, to have these kinds of visions. And as kind of a point of humor, Sabapati was also picked up by this new thought um, guru, William Estep, who was known to travel around the United States with a monkey who had learned, I guess, how to respond to um, you know, hundreds of English words. And uh, William Estep would give these free lectures um, for his uh, first church of positive Christianity. But uh, as part of his super mind science imprint, he published uh, Sabapati's uh, uh, trilingual works as works of the world teacher, esoteric cosmic yogi science. So Sabapati's works really got around. Now, one of the most... Um, Kind of compelling, I think, integrations of Sabapati's works, though, however, come in the form of Alistair Crowley's Thelema. And so we have um, Alistair Crowley already taking an interest in yoga uh, from fairly early on, from 1900, 1901 onward. And in some of these practices, like the instruction in Liber O, published in 1909, we have examples of this. So before entering upon any practice, the student should be in good health and attained a fair mastery of asana, pranayama, and padana. And then the student is supposed to kind of um, consult this book of comparative correspondences and um, create kind of magical rituals and have experiences of deities through this book and through mm -hmm. these practices. And Sabapati Swami is also mentioned here in the book, which is how I first read about Sabapati Swami. So um, thank you, Alistair Crowley. Okay. However, it goes even deeper than that. And so um, we have an extant 1900-1901 uh, diary um, where we have Shivaya Namo Om and also Sefer Ha'ain, the book of nothing, and also this uh, name that Crowley took called Abhavananda, the bliss of non-being, and Sabapati's teachings uh, were cited in the Equinox, which had the subtitle, The Method of Science and the Aim of Religion. 
And one of um, uh, his students, uh, Captain Fuller, JFC Fuller, had commissioned probably one of the first illustrated uh, diagrams outside of India of the yogic body, if not the first, with the chakras. And to give you a sense of how Sabapati's teachings were integrated, we had these different grades in um, this order of AA, where the student would have to pass through certain grades in order to obtain the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. And to do that, it required hatha yoga practice, it required jnana yoga practice, bhakti yoga practice, and a kind of raja yoga practice in order to do that. And so this was part of Alistair Crowley's project of harmonizing yoga and magic, as well as Taoism, as, as Leonard and I have been working on for our tandem volume. And you can kind of see that clearly here, where we have all of these different um, traditional magical practices being harmonized with yoga. And Sabapati's practices are a very important part of this order and this practice. And to give you a visual idea of that, these are the kind of asanas that are being practiced. We have the arrowhead, the bear, the ivy, the parallelogram. We have notions of pranayama properly performed. So kind of uh, what's known today in yogic circles as nadi shodhana. So the purification of the nadis or subtle nerves. And then we have some supplementary instructions for those of you who like to relax on your back and, you know, recline. <laughs> and so yoga is very much integrated into the system. That's Crowley himself, right? That's Crowley himself. Yes, exactly. Um, but how does Sabapati fit explicitly into this? Sabapati's practices were integrated into an instruction as part of this curriculum, the AA curriculum, called Liber HHH. And um, there are two methods of becoming God, the upright and the averse, but the mind becomes a flame or as a well of still water. And then there are three contemplations, as it were, breaths in the human mind, that is the abyss of hell. The first is necros, the second pyramis, and the third phallos. So I wonder if you can guess which one Sabapati fits in here. <laughs> okay, so, and this is an example of this still, the same uh, triad being engaged in contemporary uh, practice today. So you're supposed to be seated in an asana, preferably the thunderbolt. I don't know, Wang Chun, if you want to give it a try. It's a little bit intimidating. But here are these other two, the god, which is seated in a chair, the ibis, interestingly, with a Masonic apron, and the dragon kneeling. So you're supposed to be seated at, in an asana. And in this practice, the cavity of the brain is the yoni, the spinal cord is the lingam. Concentrate thy thought of adoration in the brain. Now begin to awake the spine in this manner. Concentrate the thought of thyself in the base of the spine and move it gradually up a little at a time. And this SSS is also very important because that's Sri Sabapati Swami, but it's also a pun because uh, the letter S uh, signified the Hebrew letter Shin, which referred to fire. So it's kind of a clever pun for Sri Sabapati Swami as well as um, fire. And evidence that this came directly from Sabapati Swami is located in Crowley's diary. Draw the light of your two eyes internally to Kundali, which is this notion of the base of the spine, by Ida and Pingala, these two nerves on the left and right. Imagine the mind as a straight pole, Ramarandra Kundali, and the consciousness at the bottom of this pole. Take hold of the consciousness by the two keennesses of your eyes and pull it slowly up. Keep consciousness in Brahmarandra, which is the crevice of, Branda, uh, of Brahman at the top of the head for 20 minutes. Then drop and lift it through Sushumna so fast that it takes less than one second. Compare that with Sabapati's own instructions in his lecture. Sitting in a secluded place, shut your eyes and throw the keennesses of the two sights to the Kundali. Imagine the mind to be a pole and the mental consciousness placed in the Kundali. Drop this mind by the two sights, the Brahmarandra, and so on and so on. It becomes very clear that it's a direct, uh, direct um, integration of this practice. And this, uh, to give you an idea of where the Kundali is, is at the base of the spine in this diagram here. Now that's not the only way in which these practices were integrated. Another um, ritual is it called Liber Tao, which is the book of drawing all to the point. And in this, what's interesting is that uh, 
this book on the surface would be seen as kind of a magical practice or an exercise where you have this magical circle and you're supposed to stay at the base of the, the circle or the base of this tau in the circle and cancel out basically every square uh, that is not of yourself. But the second method is where actually the hermit in an asana is meditating on various chakras and destroying them by means of the mind. And this is directly related to Savapati's notion of canceling out the chakras, which he spends actually quite a bit of time writing about in his book. So at least two rituals kind of directly uh, related to Savapati. Now the cultural relevance of this is important since it's not just Crowley, but anyone who was practicing within this certain system of AA at any point in time, would have been practicing Sabapati Swami's yogic techniques. This includes women like Leila Waddell, Lee Hersick, and Jane Wolfe, all of whom were um, practicing in this AA system in both Europe and North America. Jane Wolfe was at Cefalu in Sicily. I believe Lee Hersick was as well. Uh, Leila Waddell, they helped edit Crowley's books and publish them. So they were also practicing uh, Sabapati's yoga. We also have Carl Johannes Germer of Elberfeld, Germany, who began Thalema publishing in Leipzig. He was arrested actually by the Gestapo and claimed to achieve knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel in 1935 while in solitary confinement in Berlin and the Esterwegen concentration camp. So here's a, an interesting example of um, someone kind of being arrested and claiming to have this um, experience while in isolation. And he became actually the, um, <clears throat> the outer head of AA. Um, I don't know if the terminology is right, but he basically continued the AA and the OTO after Crowley's death in 1947. And lastly, it gets uh, even more colorful or second to last, Jack Parsons, who was one of the founders of uh, modern rock rocketry, as well as Chen Sui Sin, who was an important figure in modern rocket science, they had studied together at Caltech and Marjorie Cameron, um, Jack Parsons' wife, the two of them were involved in quite a few magical operations. Jack Parsons was involved in the AA, um, but he had done this Babylon working that Alistair Crowley didn't like shortly before his death. And Jack Parsons ended up uh, blowing himself up in a rocketry accident. Mm -hmm. But um, Chen Sui Sen is known for being one of the main uh, figures in Qigong fever in China. So there's clearly some intersection happening there as well. And Jack Parsons also talks about having these astral experiences, which again, we know goes back to this yoga as integrated in theosophy and dilemma. And finally, as a cultural example, we have Marcelo Ramos Mota of Brazil, who um, after Karl Germer's death, the, the German who was in the concentration camp and then immigrated to the United States, he got in touch with Karl Germer and started continuing um, AA teachings and traditions uh, and practice in Brazil and North America and published lots of Aleister Crowley's works and influenced a rock artist, uh, Raul Sixas. I think I hope I'm pronouncing that right as well. So what are we to make of this case study? This is kind of just one single example we could pull from to talk about modern occult yoga. Well, the seeds are already there. So uh, in Dave McKellis's book, we have a history of modern yoga, but look at the subtitle. The subtitle is already Patanjali and Western esotericism. However, there are some paradigms, and I'm happy to get into this later, that sort of um, that need to be clarified with her use of, of Western esotericism. In talking about yoga and occult as well, we have a much more kind of emic category that's true to some of the literature. Um, many of these yogis were not using the category esoteric, but they were using the adjective occult in their writings. But where do these words come from? So yoga comes from Sanskrit yuj, to yoke, to make ready, to join. Um, occult comes from French occulta and directly from Latin occultus, hidden, concealed secret. Uh, and we have this notion of kind of the uh, occult scientists. So there's, there's some consensus, and Julian Struba has written about this, Consensus that uh, kind of there's no unified 19th century occultism as kind of a social um, body or group, but occult sciences and occultism are still in emic, are emic categories in yoga. 
And this notion of occult sciences seemed to have originated in the 16th century, around the same time as that of occult philosophy. Uh, they're distinguishing kind of astrology, alchemy, and magic, but they can be expanded. Um, so divinatory arts being a part of this. And here's some um, examples of occult sciences, as well as occultism being used in Sabapati's literature, including an open letter that Sabapati Swami wrote to Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott after their meeting in Lahore, basically saying that he discussed with them the practice of ancient occult sciences, Sarva Siddhu Shastras. And so, you know, clearly there's a lot um, deeper of an exchange going on. It even formed the title of a work by Rama Prasad Kashapa, Occult Science, the Science of Breath. Now, this book um, is a translation partially of the Shiva Svarudaya, a circa 12th century Sanskrit manual on nasal prognostication, where different kind of breathing and colors can tell you the future and tell you different kind of um, uh, aspects that you would not know otherwise. Hence, occult science. It's not so much that these are for initiates only, it's that the perception of these techniques is sort of occluded from normal perception or consciousness. So in this example with Rama Prasad, we have these colors of the tattvas where someone is supposed to keep uh, five little bullets or colors in his pocket and then be able to guess which color uh, one will pull, whether it's going to be blue, red, green, yellow. And the color um, should correspond when you're closing your eyes with the color that comes to your uh, perception or view. Now, needless to say, this was extremely exciting to many of the occultists in Europe and North America. It even attracted a German translation, Die Wissenschaft des Atoms, by Pandit, uh, by someone who went by Kama, actually. And I'm grateful to uh, Lena Crawler for sending me this, uh, this edition, which is very rare, published in Leipzig. But it also entered um, in other curious milieus, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which in the 19th century started experimenting with using the tattvas, these colors that were in this occult science of breath, with having sort of visionary experiences, what they called astral travel. And so we have this notion of flying rolls, uh, these tattva cards that um, in this case, DDCF is McGrether Mathers, um, who was um, the head of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in London in the late 19th century. And he's basically instructing you how to make a tattva card based on Rama Prasad's book. Now, Moina Mathers, um, McGregor Mathers' wife, also gives some instructions in another flying rule called of scrying and traveling with spirit vision. So take the tattva cards and from them choose one at random without looking to see what symbol it may represent and lay it down on the table face downwards, then try mentally to discover the symbol. To do this, make your mind as blank as much as possible. Um, you will find that after a few moments of gazing attentively at the back of the card, that it will seem as though the thought form of the tatwa appeared to enter the mind suddenly. And so you have this notion of basically you're trying to scry into this tatwa and have an astral experience or traveling in the spirit vision based on these elements and colors that were published by Rama Prasad. So how do we talk about this? Um, we can try to resolve tensions between global and local. In my view, this notion of translocalization, also known as transculturalization, despatialization is kind of similar. Um, the idea that regional yoga, like pizza, and so we have this notion of a pizza effect coined by Agahinanda Bharati, which I, which I can talk about a little bit later if you'd like. It circulates through global networks that gradually separate it from original local contexts, but at the same time, traces of this local content are never fully eliminated. The occult reflects the local and vice versa, albeit imperfectly. And so a good example of this kind of pizza effect is the latent light culture. And Munish Kumar, who I've interviewed, he lives in Delhi, and he's kind of continuing on this uh, tradition by T.R. Sanjeevi, and they were interested in incorporating theosophical teachings, new thought teachings. They even um, engaged Aleister Crowley's writings in the context of an Indian occult order. And so Henrik Bogdan has written about this uh, Society for the Holy Order of Krishna. And so there's this notion of um, like pizza, 
it gets invented somewhere, it translocates, and then it changes and then is re uh, received or responded. Now, how do we start though talking about how to diagram all of these faces, all of these names? And so if we try, if we try to diagram, we have Sabapati Swami here, Sri Chandra Boshu, Helena Blavatsky, Henry Olcott, Crowley, Germer, Lila Waddell, we can kind of see that there's these different generations of engagement and each sort of generation, they're practicing Sabapati Swami, but they're also slowly forgetting about Sabapati Swami. So that's this notion of what uh, Kurt Leland has called source amnesia. But it's not just happening in Europe and North America. We have the same uh, phenomenon happening in South Asia. So in Tamil Nadu, we still have Sapapati Swami. We have his two gurus. We have his editor. We have other students who are mentioned in his literature. We have his student Om Prakash Swami. We have Sanjeevi who was accessing Sapapati Swami. And then his students at the shrine uh, where I read about, I had this experience with Hariharan and Vinayagam. They are also participating in this yoga of Sabapati Swami. And perhaps the same could be done with uh, Rama Prasad's book. Even though we don't have any pictures of Rama Prasad, um, unfortunately, we can also map it diagrammatically, diagrammatically and notice how some of the pictures change. We have some similar actors, but some of the actors also change. Uh, and so this becomes very interesting as well to kind of look at on that scheme. And so the final part is to show how this translocal occultism or this occult yoga, modern occult yoga, if you will, actually helps us illuminate regional yogas. And that's something that most people, um, at least in my conversations that I've had, uh, don't recognize. It's, it's, it's all about the translocal. It's all about how the, the local will influence the, the translocal occult. But what about going backwards and seeing how the translocal actually illuminates the regional yogas, the hyperlocal, if you will. And so Sabapati Swami's writings are a good example of that. You have him publishing um, you know, in English, Hindi, Urdu, Bengali, Tamil, and these are all accounts of Sabapati's life. And these accounts were not accessed by most of the translocal occultists who were only interested in his English works. But if you start to dive into the vernacular language works, you start to see many different pictures. And you start to see also depictions of gods and goddesses like um, <clears throat> the Devi and Vishnu and Shiva that point to local temple and religious culture. It also extends far beyond just gods and goddesses. We also have astrological deities like the Navagrahas, um, who uh, basically the nine celestial bodies and mantras uh, for each of these nine uh, celestial bodies are given in Sabapati's works. And the position of the deities accords how they're physically positioned in the uh, temples for Sapapati's guru, as well as um, related shrines. And so you can actually get a sense for some of the local uh, regional practices of these deities. As an example, we have um, mantras that are also placed back on the human body. And so we've kind of come full circle back to the local where um, we have the mantras for these different uh, celestial bodies being linked to the human body, which is harmonized with the linga svarupa or the human body as a shiva linga. So you have the left eye as the place of the moon, um, the right eye as the place of the sun, right ear, you know, left ear Jupiter. Um, sorry to those of you who like Mars, but you get stuck with the anus. But I mean, I guess that can still be a holy place. We also have a cat among the Naga spirit. And so this is another thing that I noticed while um, being integrated into um, Sabapati's uh, temple life, which is the presence of these Naga stones. And almost invariably, when you visit sites associated with Sabapati Swami in their local Tamil religious milieus, you'll find these uh, spirit stones. And they're all over. And that really is a connection with um, the local religious discourse of Sabapati Swami. So if we had more time, this was just one example, a deep dive into kind of how this exchange is happening in Sabapati Swami's work. If we had more time, we could also have equally spend an hour talking about Talapragada Subha Rao's notes on Hatha Yoga, Iyengar's Light on Yoga, and Gerald York's involvement, um, Om Prakash Swami and Leighton Light Culture, Kenneth Grant and the Typhonian Order, 
And we could also talk about disentangling modern occult yoga and Tantra and how those kind of uh, relate and intersect. And so my concluding remarks here are that the relative lack of treating yoga and occultism in academic fields of yoga studies or Western esotericism shows the need for a new typology or at least more awareness of the historical importance of yoga in modern occult currents. Among scholars who do treat this, the understandable focus only on the eye-catching topics like tantric sex, sexual magic, and or post-orientalist critiques have obscured other substantial aspects of historical exchanges on yoga. Just as the translocal can help us understand the local, so the local can help us understand the translocal. Both translocal occultism and regional yogas are often in dialectic with each other, with Sanskrit, English, and as we've seen also German and some other languages, often mediating. And so here are some references if you'd like to um, record any, and thank you so much.